Welcome everybody. I'm Mike Rutterath with Walker Consultants and this presentation is on building envelope assessments. Today uh, I'm going to be giving you a brief introduction of myself and of Walker Consultants and then we're going to be talking about building envelope assessments. In the overview we're going to be talking about from the top of the building to the bottom roofing, walls, plazas, new buildings and existing buildings. And then we'll finish up at the very end with uh, questions, but since we are recording this, um, the questions uh, can be forwarded to me at the very end. So the introduction, uh, the presentation summary, I'll let you read through that. Basically for a building envelope, we do everything from the inception of a project to existing buildings all the way through demolition. So for new buildings, um, we look at design drawings before they move to the field. For existing buildings, we do testing on existing buildings. And if there's problems or leaking or anything like that, we review that. Myself, I am Mike Rutterath. I have my PE license number on the screen. I'm the director of restoration in our Minneapolis office. I have a bachelor's degree in architectural engineering from the Milwaukee School of Engineering. So I deal strictly in buildings in my profession. Um, my expertise, I'm everything restoration, building enclosures, uh, structural design. I'm also involved in QAQC uh, during construction. So this year, uh, the Walker Minneapolis office is celebrating its 50th year. Uh, overall, Walker is 55 years old and started off in Kalamazoo, Michigan. So we've gone through a number of changes over the years and we you know, we're originally very parking heavy. We realize that restoration is required for parking structures, and then there's buildings that go along with those structures. So we morphed our services into building envelopes as well. So our office is located in St. Louis Park, right at the intersection of Highway 100 and 394. You can see the dot on the map. We cover all of Minnesota, so everybody in attendance today will have their buildings covered by our service area. We also uh, cover areas of surrounding states, as you can see in the graphic. So forensics, restoration, and building envelope services, we are experts in architectural and structural building systems, and we provide diversified services to mitigate potential problems in new design and assist in extending the life of your currently built assets. So our expertise in building envelope systems includes roofs, facades and plazas and that's what we'll be talking about today. So roofing types. So I'm going to address this to everybody. Um, I'm sure that there is a wide variety of experience levels in the audience today. So I'm going to go through this and kind of explain different uh, building material types, building envelope types. So that way it'll help you identify what you have on your building. So we start off with roofing types, low, low slope. We have single ply membranes. We have IRMA systems, which are falling out of popularity. Ballasted membrane systems also falling out of popularity. Green roofs are coming into popularity. Built up roofing, modified bit roofing, fluid applied and standing seam metal. So here's some example photos of these roofing types. So you can go out on your facility and, and have an idea of what we're talking about. So the single ply membranes on the left hand side of the screen, um, we have single ply membranes. Um, white roofs are very popular for energy efficiency. Uh, so that's what we have there. We also have single ply membranes uh, that are mechanically attached. In this photo specifically, this is a re-roofing application where they went over an old roof, so very economical. Um, we don't have a photo of an IRMA system. So uh, we have this architectural graphic. Um, so basically what it's showing is a, a type of overburden and whether that's pavers or typically it's rock ballast, then we have a filter media, then we have our insulation on top of the membrane, and then your waterproofing membrane actually serves as the waterproofing of the system as well as the vapor barrier of the system. And then more common systems that you'll find in, in Minnesota are ballasted membrane with rock and then ballasted membrane with pavers. In this situation, uh, there was a lot of wind scour at the corner of the building, so pavers were installed to mitigate that wind scour. 
Green roofs, as I said before, are gaining popularity um, in large cities, especially where runoff is a, is a large problem um, because the infrastructure is not sized appropriately for additional runoff from hardscape. Um, green roofing um, provides a vegetative uh, landscape and actually absorbs a lot of that water and actually helps to slow that water down before it enters the storm system. And then we have a very durable roofing system, which is built up roofing. Um, those systems, um, typically you have the smaller pea gravel and it's locked into the top of the roof, um, into that top asphalt layer. Um, those are very durable. You can get 40 years out of those roofing systems. Um, not very popular in Minnesota is modified bitumen roofing. Um, so it'll look like a, like a lapped rolled uh, shingle essentially. Um, if you have a facility that has a lot of roof penetrations, uh, fluid applied roofing is likely present um, because it details very well around perimeters, around penetrations, and provides that monolithic waterproof um, roof surface. And then we have standing seam metal roofing. So if you have um, like a larger facility, a lot of warehouse area, you might have standing, standing seam metal roofing. Um, then you have steep slope. Um, so steep slope is anything 312 slope or greater. Um, different types of roofing systems include pre-finished metal, shingles, stone tile, clay tile, wood shapes, asphalt roll roofing, single ply, and mod bit. So here's a couple of photos. Um, pre-finished metal roofing on the left, um, very popular in uh, commercial building types. Uh, shingled roofing, uh, upper right. Um, shingles typically not that common um, for commercial buildings, um, but if you have older structures that were renovated, um, chances are you have shingled roofing. And then you have stone tile roofing. Uh, clay tile roofing, very similar to stone tile. Um, and this is a, a painted or a colored uh, clay tile roof assembly. Cedar shake roofing and asphalt roll roofing. So different wall assembly types. Um, every building has walls to it. Um, you can have mass walls, you can have cavity walls or rain screen walls, barrier walls or composite walls. And um, the different type, uh, the forensic type, it actually should be um, um, glazing. So a curtain wall, storefront or punched windows. So here's a couple of uh, examples of mass walls. Um, these are typically very old buildings um, built in the 1800s into the early 1900s. Um, typically, you just had the one construction material. And as you can see from the building on the left and the building on the right, they're typically smaller buildings where you get into um, larger buildings. Uh, the walls can be four feet thick or thicker. And at that point, you know, getting windows into the walls um, uh, becomes a challenge. Cavity walls. Um, this uh, example photo on the right hand side is a stone clad cavity wall. So it has a weep system at the bottom and those can include precast concrete, uh, brick stone or other masonry veneer, stucco systems, metal fiberglass or other panel assemblies, and then wood or cement board. So here's an example of a facility on the left uh, where we have our brick cavity wall. Um, and then on the right, uh, we have a stucco cavity. So um, we'll get into barrier systems too, but stucco can be you know, uh, a barrier system or it can have the cavity behind it for drainage. And you'll notice the difference basically at the base of the stucco system. Um, if it's freely draining, um, you typically have a, a weep system behind the stucco. And then we have metal panels. Um, this is a particular new type of metal panel. Um, it's got the stone texture to it, so it actually looks like a precast or a, or a stone cladding. And then we have uh, barrier wall assemblies. So these are intended to keep water out of the wall assembly completely. So sealants are extremely important with this. Um, precast concrete, which is here in the photo, exterior insulated finish systems, stucco systems, metal panel, or terracotta. 
So the photo on the left is your typical EFIS barrier wall, which is exterior insulated finish system. So your insulation is actually to the outside of the uh, structural wall assembly. And you want to keep these things weather tight. So you want to maintain the sealants on all of these assemblies and or any damage or anything like that, get it, get it patched up right away. Stucco barrier wall on the right hand side. Um, metal panel, um, not the best photo there, um, but you can kind of see in the in the background there that we have uh, metal panels on the back. And then terracotta on uh, the right hand photo there. For composite wall systems, um, typically what we're seeing in this area is the insulated precast concrete. So the photo on the right there, uh, insulated precast, it's a uh, double T wall system, insulation, and then a, a face shell on the inside. But uh, newer to the market, uh, we have structurated insulated panels, and then we also have ICFs, which are the insulated concrete form systems. And here's uh, like a typical wall assembly for a structural insulated panel, and then also um, the insulated uh, concrete form uh, building. For plaza assemblies, um, typically this is just a roof that's at ground level, possibly below grade, and it's either got a driving surface over it or some sort of a hardscape, or it's got landscaping on it. So very similar to a, a green roof, just uh, at a lower elevation. So uh, these are the two types of systems that are common in Minnesota is the, the landscape or the hardscape. For new buildings, the best time to hire an envelope consultant is during initial design. And I know a lot of building engineers start out with the building during construction. So um, I'm sure that you have a number of issues on your buildings that you wish you would have an envelope consultant on uh, sooner in the process and that would have followed you through um, into construction and then as the building was occupied uh, into occupancy. But for um, the design phase, uh, typically services include review of construction plans, building elevations, review of construction details, we want to see how everything's tying together and sometimes details can be omitted and then lastly uh, review of the specifications and we can work for a number of different entities so we can work for the architect of record and we can provide a review earlier in the design process maybe a 50 percent design review or it can be uh, at towards the end of the project where it's like a 95 percent review uh, we can also work for building owners act as owners representative uh, we can work for the general contractor or we can work for subcontractors on a project if it's product specific let's say waterproofing or glazing or something like that so here's some examples of work that we've done here in Minneapolis as far as markups of buildings. So the elevation on the left, you know, we have uh, two buildings that are getting joined together and we're looking for very specific detailing. So we went through and um, uh, cut a couple of details on there as to where we want the architect to actually show uh, relevant details for those uh, facade elevations. And then on the right hand side, um, that is one of the following details that associated with that. So as you can see, um, there was originally like foam called out in there. The, the, um, the glazing contractor is going to want to put um, an actual closure plate on there so we may have something decent to seal to. Also looking at building movements, making sure joints are sized appropriately for building movements. Other things that we mark up, uh, wall flashings are a big deal where we have transitions between high, low roof steps and building elevation, um, any type of expansion joint, uh, very critical. Here we have a high, low and an expansion joint all at the same location. So to get this thing detailed properly is very critical for keeping water out of the building. And then also on the right hand side, uh, we have a bunch of roofing details, a bunch of standard details, um, some specific details for the project. Um, we go through and mark those up, redline them up, and um, offer our opinions to the architect of record. So now we move into what you guys all experience every day of your life. Um, it's existing buildings, and we have that proactive versus reactive uh, management of building mentality.
So we all know that as we become more reactive, um, it kind of puts a wrench in everything from schedules to uh, fees and um, uh, you know, if, it, if the building's leaking and you're not proactive about it, now you've got additional damages, that type of thing. So you, you kind of have your asset management at the very center of, of this nucleus. And around the outside edge, you've got, you know, your inventory, uh, you assess buildings, you prioritize, you plan, and then you execute. So the cost of deferred maintenance, and I think we're all familiar with this too. Um, you know, the, the longer you wait to do any sort of restoration or maintenance on your facility, it costs more. So if we start out at normal wear and you keep doing, you know, uh, intermittent repairs for the normal wear, we just threw a number at this, uh, $30,000. So let's say every, every five years you're spending $30,000. Um, but however, if you wait longer, all of a sudden those repair costs go to $80,000. And then you're in the same repair frequency down the line. You started a little bit later, um, but now you have the same repair frequency, but your costs have gone up. And then similarly, if you start having major failures on the structure, um, you've got freeze thaw damage, you let your joint sealants go too long, you got water in the building, everything else. I mean, you can have major repairs and, and those costs really escalate. Some effects of deferred maintenance. I mean, you have everything from corrosion, you have um, pieces falling off of buildings. I mean, you have the terracotta building on the left and terracotta has um, typically like steel reinforcing that supports it. And if you don't maintain your joints and your terracotta, water gets in, starts corroding out your steel and then you have bigger problems. Uh, the building on the right hand side, um, you have uh, your brick veneer essentially fell off the building. So if you've had corroded ties or anything like that, um, you need to maintain your, your facade to prevent the corrosion of those ties to begin with and then uh, preserve the longevity of the building. Uh, some more brick that have fallen off the building. Um, and this looks like a concrete frame building uh, with masonry infill and large failure there, uh, likely due to water ingress and or failure of any ties. And then you have corrosion or reinforcing steel, which are visible on the right hand images. So if you don't have one already, uh, please talk with your owners about having a building asset management plan. So you want to go through and you want to define your inventory of your buildings. Do you have um, buildings of the same construction type? Do you have buildings of different occupancy? So define your inventory, figure out what you need. And then you assess the facilities, then you prioritize repairs. So if you have a warehouse and you know a leaking roof isn't as big of an issue in a warehouse versus in an office building, you might want to prioritize that office building. And then you want to plan ahead for maintenance, you know, go with that proactive approach. You recognize, you know, the longevity of, of metal panels or of sealants or of other materials, and you plan ahead for that maintenance. And then the most important part is executing the plan. So in your inventory, you know, we I talked about this a little bit, multiple buildings of the same use. Let's say you have an office campus, uh, so everything is office. Otherwise you have uh, multiple buildings of different uses. It could be mixed use development where you have some office, some residential, retail. And then you want to look at the age of your structures too. A uh, new building you want to be very proactive on and get ahead of maintenance as it occurs. Older buildings, uh, you might have inherited something where you're already behind the curve on maintenance. So you're looking at significantly more uh, cost for upkeep of those buildings. And then looking at the importance of the structures and then also building additions and modifications. So if you have an older facility, and this is notorious with hospitals, where hospitals keep getting added onto again and again and again, uh, you might have some poor performing areas of the facility and then you have some very new um, modern areas of the building that, that perform much better. And then figuring out who is responsible for what. Um, you know, are, are you responsible for everything? Um, is, is there maintenance or is there um, um, things under warranty? So, um, you know, the contractor could still be responsible for warranty items. And then have your facilities been assessed before? 
and then when have they been assessed? Um, when you call uh, an envelope consultant to determine scope of services, um, think about what what you want, what your end needs are. You know, do you need a general condition assessment or a de detailed condition assessment? Um, a lot of times, you know, um, if you're looking at, you know, a, a one to five year area, you could probably do a very detailed condition assessment, get some pretty good numbers uh, for budgeting. Um, otherwise, if you're doing, you know, brand new building, do a general condition assessment and try to figure out what your costs are over the long term. And then investigations that we can perform, you know, is it uh, air or water leakage issues that you may be seeing is a condensation? How do you discern between the two? And uh, we can help you with that. And then also material deterioration and then failures. So the purpose of uh, condition assessments is to develop an understanding of the general health of the building envelope. So are you in um, like a maintenance type category? Um, what's the performance history of the building if you've been at the, the building for a while? You know, talking to the people that manage you know, individual components of the facility. And then reviewing existing documents, if they are available. I know on a lot of older buildings, they are not available. So that um, um, can create problems too, or cost escalations. And then review of the building envelope, uh, which is what I'm talking about here today, document existing additions and determine needs of repair and maintenance. So once we get into assessment methods, uh, variety of methods here, if you see your engineer looking like the guy at the center bottom of the screen, um, you probably have a pretty big problem on your uh, on your building. So uh, we're much more inclined to comment on that than you know something interesting in one of the windows. So um, the cheapest of facility facade condition assessments is from ground. So where we can access roof areas, where we can access most of the facade areas from ground, um, just review everything that way, whether it's via, you know, up close like I am there in the, the photo, or if it's via binoculars or anything like that, by far and away uh, your cheapest method of reviewing uh, visually. And then if we need access to specific areas, uh, we have access to lifts generally, uh, which are much cheaper than swing stage. Another option is yeah, actually getting rigging on the building, going up to the roof and tying everything off and then dropping swing stage down on the side of the building. Uh, it's very expensive. Some of the newer technology out there, we have drone surveys and uh, whether you've used drone survey or not on your building yet, um, it's, it's a great first step. And we've done everything from just a general visual survey to actually going through with the drone and um, getting enough data points that we can actually create a 3D Revit model of the structure, and then we can produce our construction documents from that Revit model. So drone surveys um, can also include um, uh, thermography, which we have uh, coming up here in a little bit. Um, those those lenses are very expensive yet uh, the cost keeps coming down though so it'll probably be very commonplace here in a few years then we have difficult access areas so instead of doing a full swing stage uh, a lot of times if you have the right uh, person uh, you could just drop a, a line over the edge of the building and then have somebody come down on their on their own and review up close other non-destructive testing methods, um, we have chain dragging or acoustic sounding. So listening for delaminations or defects within the materials themselves. So whether it's a chain drag rig like this on an upper level or whether it's uh, hammer tapping on a vertical surface or rod tapping overhead, that's what we're listening for there is, is um, deterioration that you can't see with the naked eye. And then uh, sealant bond testing. So whether you have an existing sealant or a new sealant, um, Get out there and do some destructive testing, some non-destructive testing and check the bond of that concrete. Here's your thermography images. So basically you're using infrared light to locate possible areas of leaking within the building or trapped water within the building. So these are some great photos here of uh, water that's actually trapped in the building, which wouldn't necessarily be visible to the naked eye. 
another technology that um, has come about in the last 10 years or so is photogrammetry. And you may not be familiar with this. So what it is is uh, a technology that takes a lot of photos and meshes them together and creates a 3D image. So you can see on the left and on the right, you know, the more intricate a detail that you need or, or would like to have in the end result, the more photos you need to take. So when you're doing a full facade assessment, you know, the photo on the left is probably going to get you the right level of detail that you need. However, if you have detailed ornate cornices, um, you know, the level of detailing, uh, the number of photos on the right is, you know, significantly more. So non-destructive water testing. So if you have masonry buildings and you're wondering uh, what's the absorption of those buildings or how much uh, liquid is actually getting into my buildings, how much rainwater is actually leaking in, um, you can do Rylan tube testing and you do this both ways. So the, the photo on the left is shown testing the face of the brick. You can also put this right over the, um, the joints and then you test uh, the competency of the joints. And then you have uh, AMA 501.2 uh, spray nozzle testing on the right. You can do another AMA test, um, which is the spray rack test. So if you're testing larger areas, um, these can be mounted to you know, wood structures if it's close to the ground. Here we're using it uh, attached to a lift. You can also attach these to swing stages if you have very large buildings. The issue then might be, hey, where's my water source? How can I get water out there for appropriate testing? And then on the right hand side is where we actually have chamber testing. So if you took the spray rack on the left hand side, and then if you actually put an air chamber on the back side of that wall, you create a negative vacuum which simulates uh, wind pressure blowing on the outside face of the wall. Uh, Non-destructive testing at balconies. Uh, so we remove pavers. You want to look at what's underneath them. And once you've got the pavers removed, you can look at your edge terminated conditions. You can look at, you know, the filter fabric that's over the top, the um, underlying rigid insulation all the way down to the membrane itself. And once we get down to the membrane, whether you're on a roof, uh, a plaza, a balcony, um, you can do destructive roof cuts. So on the left is where we have um, uh, insulated roof with a single ply ballasted membrane. Um, so we clear the ballast away and cut out a, a little tab of the uh, membrane and then we look all the way down. So why we want to do this is we're looking for, you know, the insulation. Is it wet? Is it dry? Um, do we have a vapor barrier on the bottom of this? Is the um, uh, is there a cover board or anything like that? So we're looking for, you know, the, the assembly of that roof. On the right hand side of the photo, um, that's uh, a core method. So it's very quick. Uh, the guys just come out, they clean off an area, they, they push a core machine through real quick. On that one, we did actually find water um, in that roof assembly. So that requires uh, uh, a replacement of the roofing membrane. Uh, destructive testing of fenestrations. So here we actually remove uh, portions of the glass. So you, you remove the portions of the frame that hold the glass into place and then you actually remove the glass. So what we're looking for on this is the condition of any of the, um, uh, the, the frame itself, the condition of gaskets and sealants of the insulated glass units, um, any or any of the above. Destructive testing of facades can tell you a great deal about why the building's leaking. Uh, the stucco assembly on the left, it's a barrier stucco assembly. It's not intended to have a significant amount of water behind it. In this case, we had leaking going on um, above this window and everybody was trying to figure out why. Well, you can see that once water got into the wall assembly, there's a very small gap in between the flashing and the stucco. So the water that got into the wall is unable to drain freely out of the wall. And once that water built up behind, you can see the small vertical lip of that flashing system. And once that water built up, the water just went right back up over that back lip of that flashing and into the building. And then on the right hand side, uh, EFA structure, so exterior insulated finish system again. And in this photo, uh, this was taken down in Florida. Uh, I looked at a 
project down there. This is a barrier EFA system. So the very first thing you should notice is that there's no weather barrier behind that EFAS. So this particular owner let his sealants go a little too long and water was actually getting behind the EFAS and deteriorating uh, the wall structure out. And then we have uh, destructive testing of facades. So the photo on the left, uh, we didn't think that there was any problems with that steel lintel until we uh, started rebuilding the masonry pier. And then all of a sudden we found this condition where most of the steel beam was corroded completely away. So what's not shown in this photo is the very large shoring towers on either side of this connection. So everything's temporarily supported, make sure the brick doesn't crack. And then we go through and in this case, we replaced the section of the beam. So field cut it and then uh, re-welded new, new sections back in place. And then on the right hand side where we have uh, brick masonry with steel lintels, um, there's no through all flashing at this location. So any water that gets within that wall sits on the steel plate and then that steel plate is welded to the steel beam behind it and you have plenty of opportunity and therefore corrosion of that uh, steel. Destructive testing at plazas is very critical to figure out what's going on. So the photo on the left, um, we have leaking issues in this plaza and we were trying to figure out why exactly it was leaking. And in this particular case, you can see that the backfill that was used, I mean, there's a lot of clay in there, a lot of fines in there. So the material itself doesn't drain very well. So in that photo, um, this was an overnight water test and typically, the water is gone by the next day, um, if not within minutes of, of putting water into the test opening. So this is a very poorly draining sub base on this particular plaza. We ended up ripping everything up and, and replacing the plaza completely on that project. And then on the right hand side too is, you know, the termination of the uh, existing plaza membranes. You know, if you can pull it away with your hand, it's not very well bonded or uh, they forgot to put a termination bar or something like that to hold the top of the, the membrane together. Uh, other plaza photos, uh, the photo on the left, everything was dry when we opened it up and then when we pushed on it, uh, it felt a little spongy in there. So we ended up taking a scratch all and poking it right through the membrane and we had a little spout of water that popped up through there. So um, you do not want water behind your plaza membrane. So this one uh, we're still looking at right now, uh, trying to figure out if we're doing a partial replacement or a full replacement of that system. Also the photo on the right, you wanna make sure that you have competent substrate behind your waterproofing. In this photo, um, there was precast concrete, hollow core precast, that came out to the edge of the, the floor assembly and they waterproofed right over the end of the cores without uh, filling the end of the cores. So we were able to, again, to poke that scratch all right through the membrane. So it's obvious that the membrane is not attached to anything at that point. So destructive testing of building envelope also occurs at the interior of the building. So if we have leaking water observed at the interior of the building, a lot of times we have to do test cuts through the wall assembly to try to figure out where that wall's coming in. So you can see the photo on the left-hand side, we have a, a drywall interior. This is in a residential structure and it's adjacent to a jog in the exterior. So we have the glazing on the outside and then I believe we had barrier precast on, on this particular building. And you can see uh, the good news in the photo is um, you have that clear piece of poly that's kind of hanging out of the test opening on the left-hand side. So they do actually have a vapor barrier in here, which is good. Uh, the photo on the right-hand side, you can kind of see how the window system is clipped into the structural, uh, it's actually the, the precast, exterior precast system. So, um, you know, the competency of the overall assembly is, is questionable here as to how everything tied together. And if you've got an aged building, uh, you are very familiar with uh, facade deficiencies, deficiencies on your structure. Um, starting from the left hand side, uh, we have precast uh, pieces that are cracked or terracotta pieces that are that are cracked showing uh, evidence of failure. Uh, the photo, uh, the brick photo in the middle, that's where the brick is expanded as it's supposed to and has actually pushed the sealant out of the joint. Uh, 
So that needs uh, to be recut open, sealant joint replaced. The center photo is you have abandoned anchorages that were not sealed. So make sure if you're taking signage off your building or anything else that's anchored to the building that you go back and you seal everything up or patch it properly. Uh, the photo, if you have an older masonry building, photo on the lower right is of a deteriorated masonry parapet wall. A lot of freeze thaw durability there. And then you can see the leaching too of all the, the lime. And then uh, cracking, so building movement at uh, corners, uh, especially in masonry buildings, you'll, you'll see a lot of cracking if joints are not properly installed. Other facade deficiencies are, you, you can see the tuck pointing repair below and then the original mortar above in this joint and everything is cracked. So the, the repair didn't actually fix anything just by uh, fixing the deteriorated mortar. And then uh, you have uh, mortar in concrete masonry units on the bottom. You have other cracking uh, above windows is very common at corners is very common. And then um, just deteriorated sealants uh, on the right hand side. You can also have embedded reinforcing that's corroding, causing some pop outs, especially if you don't maintain the facade on the, the upper left. When you look from below, um, you'll actually see more um, more cracking and more corroding. And then you have the evidence of leaking too with the efflorescence on there. Um, building intersections. So you have a balcony intersecting a brick masonry wall and the jointing was not performed properly. You want to make sure that you have plenty of gap around those intersecting units for the brick to expand and contract differentially from the concrete structure. And then on the right hand side, you know, look for um, a lot of materials coming together and this one, you know, it's a, a overhanging wall. So you've got weather exposure on multiple sides. You've got multiple components coming together. Um, make, make sure that you have everything uh, built properly, um, especially like on this metal panel assembly. So if any water gets into the assembly that it can get out. Facade uh, glazing deficiencies. So the photo on the left, um, if the glazer stretches the um, the gasketing material when he installs it, it'll relax again through thermal cycles and it'll actually have gaps at the very end. So if you've got water leaking into the building, it's probably coming in faster than it's uh, being allowed to, to leak out of the building again. And then you have uh, right below that a failed cap seal uh, attempt at keeping water out of the building. So the sealant joint has failed. Um, at the right hand side, you've got a reverse sloped uh, roof flashing, and then you have weep holes the wrong direction. So it's actually allowing water into the assembly versus kicking out of the assembly. And then uh, making sure too that uh, the contractor during construction that he cleans out those weep areas, uh, which is the lower right hand photo. Roof deficiencies. Um, man, uh, the first thing that people do when they have a leak in the roof is they grab a caulk gun and they go up there and put sealant all over everything. So we've got a mess of sealant there on the left. However, they didn't um, properly fix the cap flashing. They should have just started with that and been done. A um, lot of sealants in, in all of these photos trying to fix um, existing problems, but then the sealants are, are not complete. So a lot of times you want to do your roof flashing correctly so that way you're not relying on sealants. Um, sealants are the first thing to fail and are you know, seldom maintain on the structure. Other roofing deficiencies, whether you have ponding of existing roofs, um, you know, just general deterioration of the roofing, the center top photo. If the contractor doesn't properly seal all the laps, uh, bottom center photo, um, you have issues with um, clay tile falling off of steep slope roofs. Uh, we have penetrations through roofs on the upper right where we have corrosion and sealants trying to do a, do a lot of work there. And then uh, on the bottom left is just an example of a roof assessment report. Um, and that's our, our field notes on there. Uh, masonry failure. Um, these are some more photos that we saw some earlier. This is uh, an overhead condition at uh, windows and Basically, the the photo or the window on the right hand side in that photo, the, the entire top is 
fallen off of that. So water's been getting in there for years. It corrodes all the steel reinforcing and then the entire thing fails and, and drops. Thankfully, you know, nobody's hurt on something like this. Glass has been more of an issue lately. So as the aggregates for glass uh, become more scarce, contaminants within the glass become bigger problems. So you can put up a brand new building and you'll, you might have a pop out on the lower right hand side. So that could be an example of some of the contaminants that are actually within this glass that show up after the, the glass is on site. So pay particular attention to that. Also uh, the upper right uh, photo, if your glass isn't allowed to expand and contract properly, stress is built within the glass and then you can actually have um, uh, breakage of the glass due to that. Um, once we get onto a facility, documenting everything is critical. So, you know, taking a building ele elevation out with you, if you have an older building and you don't have elevations, we might come out ahead of time, photograph the building and create our own elevations. And whether that's photographs of elevations or whether it's a CAD drawn elevation or even a hand-drawn elevation of a small enough building. Um, we'll provide that ahead of time. And then uh, floor plans on the, the left-hand side. And after we have all this data, um, the most critical thing for any owner is what's it going to cost me? Um, so what's required and what's it's going to cost? And then also uh, we work with you to determine when this work can best be performed. Obviously, if you have an active leak into your facility, you probably want to take care of sooner than later. Um, but then we want to know who is impacted, you know, who's actually in that space within the building. And then, um, you know, the, the level of importance. Again, I, I made the analogy to a, a warehouse versus an office space or a residential space for that matter. Um, you can probably let things go in the warehouse a little bit longer. And then also, uh, you know, take into consideration life cycle analysis. Is it better to replace all of the sealant on a building versus try to repair a little bit of failing, failed sealant at the time? And maybe it's a budgetary question. Maybe you've only got the money right now. Just do a little, um, little repair on the failed, existing failed sealants. So uh, we'll work with you on that and try to figure out what is the best overall solution for the entire building. And we can provide repair plans. Um, this is the budget plan. This is what the owners love to see. Hey, how much am I spending every year? Um, uh, again, we can do these for one to three year cycles. This one's a uh, five or a six year cycle. Um, we can do them up to 30 years, up to 50 years. The problem is the farther out you get on your projections, uh, the fuzzier the numbers get. So there's a lot that can happen in five years, let alone um, what can happen in, in 50 years. So who would have saw COVID coming, right? So um, that's the end of the presentation. Um, obviously, we can't ask any live questions right now. However, here's my contact information. If you have any questions on your building, uh, questions in general, feel free to give me a call, get in contact with me. Um, it may be a simple question that I can answer. Um, I just had a text message at eight o'clock last night from a guy. Hey, I got this crack in my building, it's leaking, what do I do? Give me a call in the morning. So I called him back right away this morning. And sometimes the answer is, we have to know a little bit more about the facility to determine why why that crack is present and then the proper repair techniques. So I'm gonna end up going out to that facility a little bit later and uh, reviewing it firsthand. But anyway, uh, I thank you for attending the conference and I thank you for uh, watching my presentation. I wish you all a good day and thank you very much.